Hello, this is Michael Altos. We are starting a section on opioids and context-sensitive halftime. This is recording part one. First, a just brief historical reference. Opium, which is named from the word opos, which means juice, opium comes from the poppy seed, which has been known about for more than 2,000 years. Morphine, which is one of the substances most commonly made from opium, is named after Morpheus, who was the god of dreams, and it was already being used widely in the 1800s. In the Civil War, morphine was used quite a bit for battlefield injuries, but it became limited once they realized the significant respiratory depression and death that the morphine would cause. We know that opioids are any natural or synthetic or endogenous substance that has morphine-like properties. And the properties would be any kind of analgesia without loss of touch, proprioception, or consciousness. The body has endogenous opioids that it synthesizes. These include uh, substances like encephalins and beta endorphins, and they bind to opioid receptors that are throughout the body in virtually every tissue. There are many different subtypes of the opioid receptors. The most common is the mu subtype, which is where most opioids act. And this is responsible for analgesia, as well as respiratory depression, the meiosis, the pinpoint pupils, the euphoria, some of the physical dependence, as well as side effects like constipation and maybe urinary retention. There are, other ca there are also kappa, delta, and sigma receptors which are responsible for other components of analgesia and sedation, as well as side effects. Opioids can inhibit the release of excitatory neurotransmitters and the response to excitatory neurotransmitters in nociceptive neurons, which are the, no the neurons that transmit pain signals. And again, opioid receptors are throughout the CNS as well as in peripheral nerves. we can administer opioids by multiple different routes. Obviously, we can give them IV, which is the most rapid and complete absorption. They can also be given as an intramuscular injection. This is done for morphine or meperidine, and you'll get an effect starting at about 20 minutes with a peak within 60 minutes. Opioids can be taken orally. They are available transmucosally as a lollipop that can be absorbed through the cheek, or transdermally as a patch, we can give opioids neuraxially, and they'll diffuse to the opi opioid receptors in the spinal cord. This can be done through spinal or epidural roots. And this is an advantage over local anesthetics because there's no sympathectomy, no motor blockade, no loss of proprioception. And we specifically get visceral an analgesia with opioids more than somatic analgesia. About 10 milligrams of IV morphine is equivalent to one milligram of epidural morphine, which is equivalent to about 100 micrograms of intrathecal or spinal morphine. So you can see the rule of tens applied here for morphine. This is less true with lipid-soluble opioids because they cross the, bar the blood-brain barrier. So for example, fentanyl, where you might give 25 micrograms IV, you could give almost the same dose epidurally and pretty close, maybe 10 to 25 through the spinal space. When opioids are given intravenously, the distribution half-life is about 5 to 20 minutes. These drugs cross the blood-brain barrier because they are non-ionized and relatively lipid-soluble. Some drugs have a first-pass uptake in the lungs, specifically fentanyl, and small doses are redistributed to other tissues. The drugs undergo biotransformation primarily in the liver. Some opioids, like morphine and meperidine, have active metabolites, which means that their metabolic byproducts can still have some analgesic effects and, perhaps more importantly, can have side effects. Other drugs, like fentanyl, sufentanyl, and alfentanyl, have inactive metabolites. Then there's remifentanyl, which we'll discuss a little bit later. 
its metabolism is not in the liver, but rather it undergoes ester hydrolysis via plasma esterases. And I should point out that this is not pseudocholinesterase, which we associate with succinylcholine. These are other plasma esterases. A lot of opioids and other anesthetic agents as well are metabolized by a member of the cytochrome P450 family called cytochrome 2D6. About 7 to 10 percent of Caucasians, 2 to 4 percent of African Americans, and 1 to 2 percent of Asians are labeled as poor metabolizers. These patients have homogeneous alleles for the deficient cytochrome. 2D6 enzyme. This is going to affect metabolism of oxycodone, hydrocodone, tramadol, and codeine into their active forms. These drugs are given as a prodrug and the body metabolizes them, metabolizes them into their active forms. And so these patients, when treated with these drugs, will have inadequate analgesia using these opioid medications. Deficiency in this enzyme can also affect metabolism of meperidine and methadone, leading to prolonged clinical effect. Opioids are primarily excreted in the urine. This is especially significant for drugs like morphine and meperidine, whose metabolites are active. Morphine has morphine 3-glucuronide and morphine 6-glucuronide, Meperidine has normeperidine, and in patients with significant renal disease, accumulation of these active metabolites can lead to substantial side effects. And for that reason, these drugs should be used carefully with caution in patients who have renal disease. The first opioid that we'll talk about a strong opioid agonist is morphine. And this is the template that we'll use to compare other opioids. Morphine is given at doses of 0.01 to 0.1 milligrams per kilogram, or let's say about 2 to 8 milligrams IV every 5 to 10 minutes. It acts at the mu receptors. It can decrease the MAC during anesthesia to about 65%. It crosses the blood-brain barrier slowly with an onset of about 5 minutes and a peak in 10 to 40 minutes. It is partially protein-bound, it undergoes rapid redistribution, and its elimination half-life is about one and a half to three hours. This can be longer in neonates and in older patients. Morphine has high hepatic extraction, and so its elimination will be affected in the case of decreased hepatic blood flow. As we said, morphine has active metabolites, which are excreted in the urine and so patients should be monitored carefully if they have renal failure. Morphine can be reversed by naloxone, also called Narcan, which we'll talk about a little bit later. In the CNS, morphine can cause sedation, cognitive impairment, and euphoria. It does decrease cerebral metabolic oxygen consumption, cerebral blood flow, and intracranial pressure, as long as you maintain normal CO2. People have meiosis, which is pupillary constriction, and can experience pruritus, which is itching. After large doses of opioids, patients can experience some muscle rigidity, and it can be so severe to even interfere with our ability to manually ventilate patients. Nausea and vomiting is a common side effect by stimulating the chemo trigger zone in the medulla. As far as respiration, morphine decreases your hypercapnic response, your hypercapnic response, and does lead to hypoventilation, even apnea. Many patients who are over sedated or over narcotized with morphine will be arousable and can take a deep breath on command, but otherwise they will hypoventilate. Morphine also decreases the cough reflex. The respiratory depression from morphine can occur within minutes, or it can be delayed for several hours, and so patients receiving morphine may need monitoring, especially if they are at higher risk for respiratory depression. In the GI system, morphine decreases motility, which can cause constipation. It slows gastric emptying, increases the bile duct tone in the common bile duct, and can even lead to biliary spasm. 
It causes urinary retention. Morphine causes histamine release, which can lead to hypotension and dilation of the cutaneous blood vessels, causing flushing or a rash. Morphine can prevent the stress response at high doses, and I've seen people use it to prevent the inflammatory response that occurs during cardiopulmonary bypass. Morphine can cause hypotension at higher doses, especially in patients who have an, a high baseline sympathetic tone, and it can cause bradycardia at higher doses. Hydromorphone, or Dilaudid, is very similar to morphine. It's also a strong agonist with similar efficacy. It is much more potent, about 5 to 10 times more potent. We would say that 1.5 milligrams of hydromorphone IV equals 10 milligrams of morphine IV. But hydromorphone has no active metabolites, making it a better choice for renal patients. Its length of action is 3 to 4 hours, with a dose of 2 to 8 micrograms per kilogram, or let's say about 0.2 to 0.4 milligrams, IV every 5 to 10 minutes. Methadone is a strong agonist with a much longer duration of action. Methadone is used in the treatment of opioid withdrawal and in chronic pain syndromes. Not only is it a mu receptor agonist, but it's also an MDA, NMDA antagonist, similar to ketamine. Heroin is a substance that's produced by acetylation of morphine. It has a very quick CNS onset, it doesn't cause much nausea, and as we know, it's commonly used as an illicit drug to achieve a euphoric high. Heroin is not really used for medical use in the US, and it's not commonly used for medical use in other countries either. That's the end of our first section. Please let me know if you have questions about any of the material.